am live. Hello. Good evening. Uh, it is the 31st of July 2023 and I'm reading out of Joan Grant's autobiography. Joan Marshall Grant was a seer and a writer of her own far memories. Uh, she had various incarnations, reincarnations, and uh, I read her most famous, I think, was Winged Pharaoh, uh, published in 1937, I think it was, and uh, Life as Carola of the early 16th century. Uh, and here she describes uh, how it all came about. Uh, it's her autobiography, and it was published in 1956. We are now in the third part of this book, chapter six, Light Your Own Candle. My parents met us in, at Southampton with money for tips and other oddments such as the hairdresser and hat bill. For I had cabled <coughs> to mother from Vigo that we were flat broke. After a week at Hailing and a fortnight with Daisy, we went to London to look for somewhere to live. Our quarterly allowance just had come in, so we had about £150 between us. But even the most squalid little flats were asking a premium as well as three months' rent in advance. So we took furnished rooms in the house in Half Moon Street, where Malcolm was living. Leslie decided that as we could have to go, as we would have to go to Scotland for the grouse shooting, it would be a waste of time to start working for his exams. So in July we went to Nock to stay with a Belgian friend. When I first met her on the Almeida Star, she had reminded me a little of Daisy. One morning she asked me why I, who was only 20, preferred to spend so much of my time talking to a woman of 65. Taken off guard, I had said, age isn't important. I may be hundreds of years older than you. She had looked rather startled, but I did not pursue the subject. Instead, she asked me to come to visit her because she wanted to meet she wanted me to meet Robert, her grandson. We took the boat to Ostend and reached Nock in time for dinner. Robert, who was six, had already gone to bed. He came to see me the next morning when I was having breakfast on a tray. A nice-looking little boy wearing shorts and a jersey. He had his left arm in a sling. He accepted a piece of chocolate offered to pour out coffee for me and then wandered round the room, fiddling with things on the dressing table and pretending not to be studying me intently. Then he said abruptly, There is something I want to show you. It is downstairs, and if you don't mind, I would like you to see it before my grandmother gets up. She is already in her bath, so if you would please not be too long. I come now. Wait, just a second while I put on a dressing gown. He took me to a box room where there was a large, unopened packing case. He foraged in a cupboard and handed me a hammer and cold chisel. Open it, please. I cannot do it myself with one hand, and I have promised not to use the other one until the bone is quite mended. I broke it, falling off my pony, which was very careless of me. Are you sure your grandmother wouldn't mind? It's addressed to her and please open it now. He was quivering with impatience. It's me in the packing case. I thought he meant that it contained something which belonged to him. So hoping that it was not a present being kept as a surprise for his birthday, I began to prize the nails from the wood. At that, at last I got the lid off and found that instead of a toy, the case would have been about the right size for a child's bicycle. It held a large oil painting. I propped it up against the wall and flicked sawdust from the glass. It was the portrait of a young man in khaki. Who was it? Obviously, someone the boy knew very well, for he was gazing at it with intense excitement and a deeper emotion very close to tears. Then he turned and looked at me solemnly. You will not laugh at me, will you? I wanted to hug him, but I knew 
the matter was too serious. I never laugh, laugh at true things. He nodded. Then you will tell my grandmother that this is not just a picture of my Uncle Albert. It is a picture of me. I went at once to tell her. I think she had asked me there only for confirmation of what she already knew. Eagerly, as though it was a profound relief at last to accept evidence which her religion made it difficult to believe, she told me many things which substantiated Robert's story. Her elder son, Albert, had always meant for more had always meant far more to her than her younger son, John. She had separated from her husband, who was English, when both children were quite small. Albert had spent most of his time with her in Belgium and had been killed in 1915, a captain in the Belgium army at the age of 23. John, just too young for the war, had been sent to school in England and had married an English wife. He saw his mother very seldom until she went to stay with them for a few days when Robert was two years old. To the other grandchildren, she was still only an elderly woman whom they hardly knew. To Robert, she was the only person who really mattered. If he was her, if he was with her, he was cheerful and healthy. With his parents, he sulked or was violently disobedient until they were thankful to send him back to Belgium. Robert was always a brave little boy, she said proudly. When he first saw a swimming bath, and he was then only three, he ran along the diving board and dived in. Albert, too, was a very fine diver. One day someone came here with a cinema camera. When he, when he pointed it at Robert, turning the handle with a clicking noise, Robert screamed, Don't! Don't! They killed me like that last time. I tried to calm him, but he became so hysterical that I had to send for the doctor who gave him a sedative. Albert went out alone into a no man's land at, at night to stop a German post infiltrating his men with a machine gun. There were eight bullets in his body when they found it, but he did not die very quickly. He had managed to crawl back, nearly back to our own <clears throat> wire before morning. There were tears in her eyes, but she continued composedly. There have been so many other things, pet names which Albert used to call me, likes and dislikes, which used to be a private joke between us, trivial in themselves, perhaps, but altogether so certain. Now I shall hang up their portrait. I have kept it hidden all these years because even a snapshot of Albert made Robert behave so, so strangely. But now it is not strange to us any more that because more than that in 1915 Albert only left me for a little while. On the 11th of August I went for the first time to Mukarach, a shooting lodge, and some 20,000 acres of Grouse Moor near Grand Town on Spey. The entire Grand family had been summoned to the presence prepared to endure, even to enjoy, in their fashion, the shooting season. His native Heath made A.D. even more of an autocrat, and when the whisper went round, father's suffering from constipation, his grown-up children tiptoed past his study door, carrying their shoes. Four days a week I tramped from dawn to dusk through heather, floundered into box, marked fallen birds, and retrieved them patiently as a spaniel. In the first week, I achieved the unusual distinction of being knocked out by a grouse. Leslie, who was a very good shot, took a right and left in front of the butt. The birds were coming fast downwind. I was trying to reload the second gun. The grouse, even though dead, was travelling like a javelin, and its beak got me between the eyebrows. <laughs> between the eyebrows. The butt, as usual, had a foot of water in it, so I was soaked to the skin. But at least I gave them something to laugh about. Non-shooting days were golf days. After the 1st of September, they were, they were, these were rare, 
for in addition to grouse, there were partridges to be followed through waist-high kale. At golf, I could sometimes get a little of my own back by egging A.D. on to bet, and then suddenly playing much better and winning, preferably on the last green. After dinner, at which most of the conversation was between me and me, for none of the children often spoke in father's presence, there was bridge. Goodness, how hard they tried to teach me to play when they needed a fourth. Luckily, the act. Does it count more when you get cards with pictures on? Couldn't <laughs> convince them that they had at last met someone with so little card sense that she was beyond teaching. On one of our Sundays off, Leslie and I went to Rosenmurchus, intending to climb towards the Cairngorms. It was a beautiful day, and we had it to ourselves, basking naked in the sun, we ate sandwiches beside a burn. It was far too hot and peaceful for serious walking, so we decided to wander, wander on for another mile or so, and then go for dinner to the hotel in Aviamor. Nothing could have been farther from my mind than spooks, when suddenly I was seized with such terror that I turned and in panic flat back, fled back along the path. Leslie ran after me, imploring me to tell him what was wrong. I could only spare breath enough to tell him to run faster, faster. Something utterly malign, four-legged, and yet obscenely human, invisible, and yet solid enough for me to hear the pounding of its hoofs was trying to reach me. If it did, I should die, for I was far too frightened to know how to defend myself. I had run about half a mile when I burst through an invisible barrier behind which I was safe. I knew I was safe now, though a second before I had been in mortal danger. Knew it as certainly as though I were a torero who had jumped the barrier in front of a charging bull. A year later, one of father's professors described an almost identical similar experience he had had when bug hunting in the Cairngorms. He was a materialist, but had been so profoundly startled that he wrote to the Times and received a letter from a reader who had also been pursuing by the thing. Some years later, when I was living at Mokarach, the doctor told me that two hikers, for whom search parties had been out three days, had been found dead. He showed me the exact spot on the map. It was the place of my terror, but both men were under thirty. One came from Grantown, the other from Aviamor. The weather was fine. They had spent a good night under the shelter stone on the highest ridge, for they had written to that effect in the book which is kept up there. They were found within a hundred yards of each other, sprawled face down as though they had fallen headlong when in flight. I did a post-mortem on them both, said the doctor gravely. Never in my life have I seen healthier corpses. Not a thing wrong with either of them, the poor chaps, except that their hearts stopped. I put heart failure on the chit, but it is my considered opinion that they died of fright. In September, there were several other guns coming to stay, so Leslie and I were free to go to Clooney Castle, which had been taken off for the season by Tom Scully, who came from Tipperary, although he was now an American. In his own way, he, he too was a bit of a tyrant, but this did not matter in the least, as I had known him since childhood and was not his daughter-in-law. Violet, his second wife, was only a couple of years older than I, and we were expecting her and was expecting her second baby, which provided a splendid excuse to stay at home gossiping instead of me being a retriever. There was only one snag in an otherwise happy fortnight. Our bedroom was haunted. I should not have minded this so much if there had been electric lights or plenty of candles, but there was never more than one candle. An overnight of the housemaid, an oversight of the housemaids, 
not an economy of violets, and I was too shy to ask for more of them. The massive four-poster bed had heavy green serge curtains, which sucked up the glimmer of my solitary light. I watched it burn lower and lower, hearing, just before it guttered out, the welcome sound of Leslie's footstep on his way to bed, with a candle from the hall. There was a friendly Labrador that belonged to the house. I made a fuss of him and he attached himself to me, and then I asked that he might sleep in my room. For a few minutes the dog gnawed happily at the, bo at, at the bone I had smuggled upstairs to make him feel at home. Then his hackles stood up. He howled. He flung himself at the door, scrabbling so frantically with his claws that in decency I had to open it and let the poor beast rush off down the passage. After that I gave an ultimatum to Leslie. Either he came to bed not more than half an hour after I did, which still left about three inches of candle between me and the dark, or else, stark naked, I would come down and fetch him. The threat of this scared him so much that he used to gulp down his whiskey and soda and come rushing upstairs. This seemed a pointless story, for I neither saw nor identified the haunt. But I mention it because at Clooney I finally decided that it was useless to go on hoping that I would grow out of the experiences which I so often found disturbing. This is a very right light, isn't it? Which I found so often disturbing. I would understand ghosts and myself only if I saw more of them and not less. The few people I knew who believed in such things were too woolly-minded, too easily deceived, or so it seemed to me, to be of any practical help. Even at that age I was too much of an empiricist, empiricist to put any real faith in what I read in books. I would be careful not to read books on subject which closely affected me. Where was I to find the knowledge I so vitally needed? I prayed very hard before I went to sleep and on waking knew that the part of me which is older and wiser than my yes everyday self must show Joan how to light her own candle. It's getting a bit d dark and I finish this chapter here and read on tomorrow chapter 7 which is entitled Here and There. Good night.